Okay guys, in this video I'm going to walk you through Webpack's hashing strategies and basically talk a little bit about Webpack's configuration and how hashing is done in in Webpack and what you you know what considerations you need to have with you when you use hashing. So I have set up a very, very basic project here with a few configuration types. So I'm going to walk you through all of these. This is going to take a while. So I'm going to split this, this, these videos up into two sections where we're first going to talk about the hashing itself, like what it is and how it works. And then we're going to talk about some best, well, best practices is a strong word, but some things that you should be aware of if you want to do long-term caching, which is something that I will cover in the next video. Anywho, let's start by just looking at the bare, bare, bare bone basis, basics. Basics. Oh, lost my word there. So, no hash. All right. What are the things that you need to know about not having a hash when you create your webpack configuration. All right, so here's our webpack configuration. This is the basic one. So you have an entry point which is called foo.js and foo.js is up here. It's a very simple program as you can see it all it does is log out foo and an under and, and underlines it and then we declare an output which is going to be a path to the dist folder which is up here and the file name is just going to be bundle.js. That's it. And our server that is serving from the source directory here is actually serving up no hash HTML, which as you can see is just including this bundle.js here. I'm already running the server, so let's go to the page, refresh it, and as we can see here, as expected, we see the bundle.js file being loaded, and our script is actually running on the page. Great, that's easy peasy. What is good and what is bad about this? Well. This is very nice because this is probably one of the most performant ways the Webpack can generate a bundle for you. It doesn't require it to do any type of hashing. So for a local development environment, this is a fairly good solution. If you're, you know, if it's, if for some reason you want to really optimize for speed, this, you know, this would make sense. Because the thing is that when you'd use cache caching. The issue only really arrives when the user is not aware of hard refreshes or like the user doesn't actually know that something has changed on on the server or in the script that you're loading. But you as the developer, you will know that. So when you make a change to your bundle.js file and you run a new build, you can actually do a hard refresh. And you, as you see here now, this file is now being fetched from the network. If I just do a soft refresh, it's from the memory, and it's going to be from memory because the file didn't change. But if I do the hard refresh, it goes to the network, and it actually gets the real file, which is exactly what we want. Now, hashing, which is like the it, the the purpose of file name hashing, is so that we as developers can create a new HTML document that is requiring a file with a different name so that if we made a change to our JavaScript on the server that the u and the user doesn't know that, the browser will simply not find the ca it, it basically the cached file, you know, it has a different name. So when the HTML comes to the to the to the user, that the new there's a new file name and because it's a, there's a new file name, it's going to automatically go to you know go to the network and get that file that's why hashing is so powerful but it, you know if you're all, if you're just working locally you're just doing stuff on your own machine just you know you don't really have to have it because you know you know that something changed so that's the first version of this no hash whatsoever let's look at the build hash so this is a slightly different setup so we're we are in, in like we're requiring path and HTML webpack plugin now this plugin all it does is because I'm a very lazy person and I don't want to have to basically create a HTML file that is going to inc to have script. I don't want to manually have to declare the files that have been generated and you know make my own HTML file. So the HTML Webpack plugin, all it actually does is that it's going to generate this file, which is just a basic, basic, basic. Let's let's actually build the whole thing. Let's build the whole thing. Build all. And it's building all the files. Come on now. Yes, yes, there we are. Let's go to the dist file. So build hash, here we are. 
As you can see, all it did for me was that it created this very basic HTML page and it has injected the script here and this script here, which is exactly what I want because I don't want to have to do that, you know, myself every single time I create new files, right, or make a change. So that's what that does. And ha here we now have two different entry points. So we have a foo and a bar file, and they're going to be outputted to the dist folder. Same thing as earlier, but now here's the difference. So because we have now multiple files, th and this would work the same way for a single file, I'm just going to sh illustrate like an issue with the build hash that you may not be aware of. You declare the name, which this is going to be for both files, because there's two files that are going to be uh, that are going to be created. So it's going to say foo or bar dot build hash dot hash and this is the unique part so the hash is going to be based on the build so if a file has changed uh, in you know since last time you ran the, this script it's going to generate a new hash so let's let's actually look at that we actually ran this so let's go to the browser and let's do build hash and here we have our files as you can see these two now files now have a hash at the end of this of the line there. So foo dot build hash dot hash. This is very, as I said, this is really really useful because this is going to be unique now, and this is now being read from the disk. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that I just made a change to this file here, k log, and I do foo two something like that and then I build everything again. I am very wasteful, but I'm also very lazy, which is, I, I've heard, a good thing for us programmers to be. There we are, we built it again, and now let's reload, so EBC, and you can now see that there's a different hash. And the power of this is that now, every time I create a, I make a change to my files, I'm gonna get a new file name, which is perfect because now that my use because my user is now going to automatically get the new content, and if the files haven't changed, well, there's they're going to read you know the file from cache. Awesome. What's the issue with this then? Well, there's two main issues that you need to have have an awareness of, in my opinion, and the first thing is that. This takes a little bit of extra time. Maybe this is not, you know, I'm not talking monstrous amounts of time, you, you know, generating a, ha a hash like this. This is perfectly fine. I mean, I'm, I, I would even say this still works for development purposes. But you may have noticed something. I only made a change in foo. So why is bar also updated to the exact same hash? And that's what a build hash does. It will update all the files with the same hash. So if I make a change to foo, bar is going to be updated. If I make a change to bar, foo's, foo is also going to be updated. The hash is going to differ. Now, that is perfectly fine when you're doing local development, but it's maybe not the best thing for when you have production code, because imagine that you had, say, that you extracted all of, say, say that you, you're using jQuery or Lodash or some really large library, and you put that in a separate file, and you just want that to be on, you know, you put that in long-term caching. Basically, you, you, what you, the desired effect you want is to put that thing into a separate file so that the user can download it once, and then whenever you change, because the odds are that you're not gonna, sh you know, you're not gonna update jQuery or anything like that very often. So the user is not gonna have to download that file very often. So it can, you know, whenever you push new changes to your own code, that only that file is gonna get downloaded. But with this setup, that doesn't happen because now, like, this hash is going to be uniquely generated for, you know, per build instead of per file. So let's look at how that looks. Let's look at that. So now we have chunk cache. And chunk cache is very, very similar to build hash. It's basically the exact same file as build hash. So I'll just go skip all of this, this explanation and just go to the to the thing that is different, which is this thing here, which is it's called chunk cache. Now chunk cache is a completely different beast. So if we go to chunk hash like that. Notice that both these URL or these hashes are different, which is exactly what we want. They're different. Isn't that awesome? And you would, you know, if you are, and this is, 
this is honestly I think this is a little bit of a I, I have an, an enormous amount of respect for the people working on Webpack but I feel this is a little bit unintuitive because you know it stands to reason that you know I have declared that I want a shunk cache therefore I expect that if I update, update foo now so let's go and update foo let's update foo and let's build everything again Da -da -da. everything is built so CB2 5D1 what happened? they both changed they're different but they both changed why did that happen? I mean that's that's not really like isn't that's not all that useful to me so the reason why they both changed is because internally Webpack actually has, you know, I'm not going to get too deep into this, partly because it's, it might bore you and partly because I'm not an expert on exactly how Webpack works internally. It's a massive, complicated, massive, massive project and it's absolutely amazing. However, internally what it's going to do is that it's going to have a dependency system and basically a so-called run a runtime that is going to load the different dependencies to the page and that code needs to be generated every time you run a build and that's kind of interesting because this shunk cache is based on the file which means that if I change foo the hash which is the ID of this shunk changes but bar has a reference to this file which means that that has to change change as well. So they're interdependent on each other, or rather, well, not necessarily, but the runtime itself needs to take have a, you know no. It basically works in the way that it has a reference to the different modules, and if the change if that changes, and you haven't extracted the run runtime outside of these files, that that code will actually change in both of these files. So that's a little bit of a more technical issue, but this is it for the first video. I just wanted to show you the pros and the cons of the caching strategies and now you might be asking me well, well Frederick how do I solve this? I want you know I want to be able to just change foo and then have bar still have the same name. I don't want that hash to be updated. I'm so glad you asked for that. I will cover that in the next part of this uh, well, it's probably going to be a two or three part series on Webpack caching. Hopefully, so far, you're following along and this has been, a, you know, given you a bit of insight into how Webpack hashing works.